Thanks, Kelly. Um, distinguished dele delegates, it's a great pleasure to be here to present the view from Australia. Of course, that's not the view from Australia, that's the view of Australia. And it's probably the view of Australia that most of us are familiar with. And I'll just ask you to notice a couple of things about that because it will come important when you see the second slide that has a map on it. And as a navigator, I can't do a presentation without maps or charts. It's just not in me because uh, it makes me feel comfortable. I'm a very simple fellow. The thing that I'd ask you to notice about that is how much of that picture is blue. The blue is the wet stuff and there's a lot of it. Try to keep that picture in mind if you would when the second one comes up. Now I began as the <coughs> first head of Australia's Future Submarine Program in February 2009 just before Prime Minister Kevin Rudd's Labor government announced its intention to replace Australia's submarines. The new submarines would be substantially more capable than the Collins boats they were to replace. They would again be built in South Australia and they would not be nuclear powered. Nothing very startling there. But the government announced that there would be 12 new boats, twice as many as the Collins class. And that was startling. Less widely known, but no less startling, to me anyway, was the fact that the Department of Defence did not ask for 12 submarines. Interestingly, there are precedents in Australia's history stretching back to Federation in 1901 for governments wanting submarines against the wishes of the Navy. On this occasion, the government wanted a submarine force numerically larger than the frigate and destroyer force. Startling. One commentator estimated the cost at 36 billion Australian dollars. That sort of rolls off the tongue. Let me say it another way. $36,000 million, how about that? $36,000 million. That was something like three times the then estimated cost of the JSF program to Australia, uh, as it was at that time, and by far the largest government capital program in our nation's history. The obvious question was, why? Opinions aside, what I found was no clear notion of why we had submarines at all, let alone why more might actually make sense. I was surprised to find that my real task as the head of the submarine program actually became answering those questions. What came as a bigger surprise again was to discover that the government was setting a new strategic direction on a naval capability to which the Navy itself was ambivalent, if not hostile. That's not a comfortable place to be when you're in the Navy, I can tell you. Um, now, I think this situation arose in part at least from our half century long habit of just replacing what we had with modern versions of the same thing. Not always, but frequently. We had rarely thought through the fundamentals. And these circumstances lead me to suggest that as we contemplate the fleets of our future, the real challenges may be, and perhaps should be, more fundamental than we think. The pace of change of technology and our strategic circumstances are factors affecting us all. The way we develop policy and make decisions in Australia uh, contribute to our circumstances as well, and we each have our own environment in which decision making takes place. We in Australia live, and I suspect that we're not alone, in an era where our decision makers seem to look little further than the next election, while being driven by the 24 hour news cycle. And there was a brilliant article, I thought, in yesterday's. Globe and Mail um, on exactly that subject relating to the per perils of the career politician. Not that I'm here to knock politicians far from it. So 
The upshot of all of this is that key policy decisions with implications spanning decades seem to be subjected very heavily to short-term imperatives in the decision-making elite. This is to scale, to give you a different perspective on the, the um, issues confronting Australia and which we use the term tyranny of distance to describe, but with which we have come to live in a way that makes us not actually understand, I think, terribly well anymore what the tyranny of distance really means. Now, while defence budgets in our clearly massive land with its small population, like Canada, always demand compromise, as wealthy a country as we are, today's tight fiscal climate complicates things more than usual. And so does history. Right or wrong, the Collins program poisons what passes for public discussion in Australia. And I know that in Canada, you understand that only too well when it comes to submarine capability. In such a climate, intensely risk conscious politicians with little real knowledge of defence tend to look for silver bullets to show decisiveness in decision making. And frequently there are no silver bullets. Certainly when it comes to submarines in Australia, there are no silver bullets. A collision of government policies I discovered also made life quite interesting for me. Defence ministers from both sides of politics said publicly that they were responsible for defence policy, not industry policy. Now, of course, this is just politics. And it is as inescapable as it is irremovable. But where there is a clear national vision, industry and security policy objectives support one another. They are not independent. They are in fact interdependent to a very much larger degree than many seem to appreciate. Defence strategists must understand the linkages and the arguments on both fronts so a clear case can be made and the, the implications of the various alternatives understood and explained, all in simple, clear language. And this is a fundamental issue. And one in which I would say that in the discussions that I was privy to in Australia, the absence of clarity, the ab absence of simplicity, the absence of the interconnectedness being understood between these uh, policy domains was sharp. If we get this fundamental wrong, we risk a destructive competition between government policy settings in critically interdependent domains. The outcome can be troubled industrial programs that waste public money as well as producing deeply suboptimal security and industrial policy outcomes. And we've seen this happen as we've heard. None of it's new and it's almost certainly not, as we heard um, from both Kelly and Admiral Cairns, confined to Australia. Questions over some very complex government policy matters became even more challenging for me several times after 2009 when defence ministers changed and eventually the government also changed. History did, however, give me some pointers to argue with. There was the Air Warfare Destroyer program, which is yet to deliver <coughs> the first, <coughs> excuse me, the first of three destroyers that were designed in Spain. It was, as we heard, turning sour, seriously so, although much political statement made domestically is for domestic pol political reasons. But it certainly was turning sour. It was late, it was over budget, and with significant problems even in the early and therefore probably most basic stages of construction of those three ships. But we had been here before. Late last century, we built two of these ships, the US Perry uh, class frigates, in our one then government owned naval shipyard, shipbuilding yard, sorry. They were the first frigates that we had built in Australia in 20 years, and it didn't start well. Two years into the contract, the program was running two years late. The government subsequently sold the shipyard and the second ship, pictured here, was eventually delivered ahead of the originally contracted delivery time and under budget. 
and she was well built. I know. I was the first captain. And many people who knew what they were talking about told me how well built she was. So we, like you here in Canada, can do this and do it well. The newly privatised yard went on immediately afterwards to execute Australia's most industrially successful warship building program ever, building 10 German designed Anzac frigates for Australia and New Zealand and delivering them on time and under budget to world class standards of quality. We can currently produce a similar standard of project execution with six mine hunters. On paper, the gap between the Anzac frigates and the Spanish destroyers was only a couple of years, but the reality is a little different. After a competition, the contract for the destroyers went to the Collins submarine builder, who had never built a ship and hadn't built anything for a decade. When the time came to acquire two large Spanish-designed amphibious ships, the politicians were convinced, and rightly I think, that we did not have the industrial capacity to do that in Australia. We asked the Spaniards to build the hulls and we would build the superstructure and integrate key systems in Australia. That project seems to be going quite well, although neither ship has yet been handed over to the Navy. Australia's history offers other lessons on what can happen when you set out to trim high cost elements of an acquisition program, more importantly, of a capability that you are acquiring, like the people. Our experience with the Collins submarines and the Anzac frigates highlights the potentially very high risk of getting such experiments seriously wrong, as well as the expense and difficulty of remediation, if it's possible at all, in a hull that has no growth capability. In summary, I think Australia's experience perhaps offers some signposts for both what might set the foundations for success and what to avoid. The headline lessons might be these. Understand in simple terms the capabilities needed and why, at a fundamental level. If we can't explain to those many people unfamiliar with naval matters why, then the what becomes the focus of the debate and the least cost alternative will probably be the outcome, not the one that represents the best value for money. Second, question the benefit of doing things at home and what should be left to overseas suppliers. These will be tough, strategic decisions that must balance competing government policy objectives. The answers may not be simple, they may not be simply arrived at, and they almost certainly will not be intuitive. In Australia, and I think Canada too, where the market is small and always will be, and industrial capacity limited, there are sound arguments, I think, for building the complex combat platforms, like destroyers, frigates, submarines, and leaving the simpler stuff, like tankers, to those overseas who have a global competitive advantage in shipbuilding. Third, if those two fundamentals suggest domestic build programs might make sense, then long-term relationships with the supply chain are probably essential. That will lead inevitably to the need to argue from a security policy perspective, issues of competition, cost premium, value for money, effective oversight and direct line of sight accountability, and so on. And finally, because I'm told, but perhaps most importantly, once warship production is started, a clear lesson seems to be, don't stop building. And this is unquestionably hard. It may even sound absurd for me to suggest it at all when confronted with tightly constrained capital budgets, block obsolescence, small demand signals that come from navies of our size. But I believe that it is possible if we re-examine some of the basic parameters around which we build our programs. We need to achieve a critical mass, which is so essential to continuous shipbuilding programs. And it's possible, but there is always a flip side, and I'm happy to discuss that further in question time. Thank you.